one of the people we invited, and we're very lucky to contribute to the whole project, not just to today's conference, was Abigail McGowan. And we sort of set her the challenge of, uh, of the Gandhi connection. So Abigail is our first speaker. She's Associate Professor of History and Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Vermont, where she teaches about South Asia with a particular focus on visual and material culture. Her research on India under British colonial rule has explored craft development, changing consumption strategies, um, and late 19th century revivals of traditional Indian design and artisanal education. Her most recent research focuses on new ideas of the ideal home, expanding use of textiles in home furnishing, and attempts to reshape housing in urban spaces. And I hope we can go straight into her lecture. No, sorry. Is there a technician who can... You have images. Yeah. Here we go. We, you, you're on. So, Kipling's Legacies, Imperial Echoes in Nationalist Craft Development in India. Abigail McGowan. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you to Julius and Susan both for the opportunity to work on the exhibition in the sort of research capacity. Um, not that I contributed anything to what is up to in the galleries, but in terms of thinking about um, my contribution for the exhibition catalog and then the chance to talk about it today. Um, and it's been, a, to me, it was a great opportunity, one, to see the sort of discovery of Kip Kip Kipling that they were uncovering and to watch that process unfold, um, but also for me to then return to themes that I've talked about and, and written about throughout my work. Um, things like the legacy of imperial aesthetics over time, things like changing taste in everyday sort of objects of everyday life, um, and then specifically something that I'm, I'm always interested in, which is how nationalism does and does not interrupt colonial or imperial ideas um, about aesthetics. Um, and there's a way in which Kipling is uh, the, sorry, we're moving too fast. Um, Kipling is sort of the ideal person to talk about this, partly because as um, you've heard, he was a key figure in the sort of art circles of colonial India. Um, he was key to all the conversations going on about what crafts meant. He was key to the institutions of the moment. Um, but he was also sort of somebody trying to shift what people used and how they thought about the stuff of everyday life. Um, and he's also sort of crucial because he really is a great way to think about the complicated fate of imperial ideas and the ways in which there are these real linkages between colonial and imperial ideas about aesthetics in South Asia uh, and then what comes in the sort of nationalist area, era before and after Indian independence. Um, and so my project is to, again, think about what those imperialist legacies are. And in doing this, I don't want to make the argument, obviously, that there's no political difference, that Gandhi and Kipling are on the same page politically. They're not. They're obviously political opponents advocating, you know, Kipling was a supporter of the Raj. Gandhi is a fierce sort of opponent of it on that same level. But my point is that uh, Kipling sort of is a great way of thinking about what I see as a real tension in craft development, both in the pre-independence moment as well as more more recently today, and that on the one hand, there's a um, craft development depends on a deep commitment to uh, the beauty, the aesthetics, the excellence, the achievements, and the possibilities of Indian crafts. Um, but there's also always a sense in which, and Kipling is a great example of this, um, that there's a deep paternalism invested in how crafts have been approached. Um, that Kipling, as the outsider who comes from uh, South Kensington to India and says, let me define your tradition for you. and let me then tell you how to improve it in ways that I think he did amazing work. So it's not meant as that means he's therefore bad. But it's a thread that has actually continued from Kipling down to the present. This is not uncommon. Um, and this is very much characterized craft development of the 1950s. And in many ways, craft development today. There's a real gulf between artisans as the sort of subjects of development and the craft development experts who tend to be educated elites uh, who have power. And that sense in which the sort of differentials of power of, of the development experts uh, as compared to the artisans they work with is the theme that will continue throughout, throughout all of this. Um, 
But before I get into that, I want to sort of speak um, through a little bit of what I see Kipling's vision as, because in many ways he is a product of his time and part of a wider conversation. And there's ways in which I also see him as very much uh, unique and able to do certain things in his moment that then shapes why his ideas get picked up later. Um, obviously, as you've sort of been hearing, one of the key things that sort of Kipling brings to the table is that he loves Indian crafts, right? He responds in ways that people have been since you know, the 1851 exhibition, to the sense of ornamental detail, the use of color, the incredible sort of density of ornamentation, the incredible technical skill that creates these incredibly detailed patterns. Um, and he's also very much a fan, as you have seen, of traditional architecture, that combination of built space, patterning, ornamentation, and the, the sort of traditional expertise that makes it possible. Um, one of the things that I love about Kipling is that he was a passionate advocate for the excellence of Indian art, and yet he was always going around telling people they were doing it wrong. Um, so, for instance, one of his great publications is the Journal of Indian Art, in which it's supposed to be, it is meant to promote Indian arts to a global audience, meant to build audiences, meant to build consumers, and yet he chooses as illustrations stuff that he thinks isn't quite right. So, in this example, again, uh, the, the Clara Dorg, they're not, they're okay, they're average. There is but little character in the design. The handles on the jugs, they're particularly bad. So here you have him as the classic instructor, right? He's like, okay, we will show you what is great about Indian arts, but I'm also gonna tell you that you could improve. And he offered that because he did think there was space for improvement. He thought there was always the chance to do things better. I think he could never really put that teaching hat aside um, in that sense of sort of the ability and the sort of possibility of endless refinement. Um, and so the, again, that sense in which he starts from absolute appreciation, but then he also starts from the need to improve. Particularly, and these are again good examples of this, he thought that the, the thing, where things went wrong often where Indian artisans were trying to take traditional skills and applying them to new things. So a traditional water pitcher might have come out okay, but trying to adapt it to a claret jug doesn't work. The biscuit tin, uh, that's a little awkward compared to what the traditional object might have been. Um, the other thing that I think is distinctive and particularly noteworthy about um, Kipling is he's also, he is not a preservationist at his heart. He is invested in India's traditions, but he wants them to find contemporary markets and to find consumers. And for that, he's always telling people to adapt. So rather than this sort of, sorry, my, it's very hard to see my little red dot, but I'll make it go slowly. Um, so if this is the traditional doorway on the left, he's not telling his artisans generally to go out and build more of those doorways. He says, go out and find ways to make furniture out of that, make sort of complicated objects that people can buy and that are more affordable, they're more compatible with modern lifestyles, et cetera. Um, and I want you to notice this one because there's an example, that same table is built up and we have the example, the built exa example up in the exhibition. Um, so he is, again, asking um, artisans to adapt, to change. He's not trying to keep them in the past. He's trying to bring them um, into new markets arguing that you can produce the best stuff in the world, but if nobody's gonna buy it, there's no point um, in doing it. So in a lot of these ways, Kipling is very much a man of his time. There's lots of other artificials, British artificials in South Asia who are trying to appreciate arts, uh, promote them, find markets for them, et cetera. What I think he does makes him different or what makes him unique at his time is three things. Uh, one is that he, actually goes out and studies the craft. So when he's creating these images of artisans at work, it's because he's really interested in how a pit loom operates. If you'll notice the sort of, the way in which that woodworker is sitting around his tools, he wants to understand how woodworkers are using their tools, how they position their body, in order to then uh, sort of offer instruction or offer ideas. Um, there are many people involved in crafts in the late 19th and early 20th century who are book learners, who are interested in uh, sort of studying the products alone. Kipling is very much invested in going around and talking to people, seeing what they know, understanding what they do in a more detailed material sense. Because for him, 
you can't change things if you don't know what's happening there right now. So as he puts it in 1883, quote, the first thing to study is the actual work of the, of the country, which alone can give you the rational point of departure for variety of design and improvement of technique. So again, deep knowledge produced in, in uh, sort of refined writings, exhibitions, et cetera. That sets him apart. The other thing that sets him apart is that he is working with artisans. He is very much work interested in hands-on work. Again, he's not sitting behind a drafting table solely, um, but he is interested in being with people as they are producing what they're doing. This is true in the Mayo School, where he is you know, teaching students from the time he gets there in 1875 until when he retires in 1893. But it is equally true outside of the school. He is sought out by artisans around the Punjab for advice, for assistance, for new designs, um, et cetera. And apparently was considered um, sort of a, a sort of useful advisor to people. So in an 1884, the director of public instruction for the Punjab praised Kipling, noting that artisans found him, quote, a kindly and skillful advisor possessed of knowledge and training of an order hitherto unknown to them, and yet full of an appreciative recognition of their own powers and methods, and inspired with a desire not to supersede, but to improve the latter. So that sense of he's, a, he's, not, under, he's not afraid of getting his hands dirty. He wants to get out of the school out of the office and work with people on the ground. The third thing that makes him distinctive is quite um, simply that he was able to get his ideas everywhere because he monopolized or was able to dominate so many of the means in which ideas about crafts got out to public audiences. And again, this is through print. The Journal of Indian Art is sort of one of the first publications that offers a regular sense in which you can understand different regional traditions in full illustration. So if you're trying to define what the tradition is and you are the editor and often the writer for this, you have a seat at that table in powerful ways. Um, again, organizing exhibitions where as the organizer of the Punjab exhibition and central to the collections made possible, he He's the one deciding what goes in and what goes out, what the best example is and what the one that maybe should be left behind is. And that's a powerful role that gives him authority over what's going on. These are exhibitions, again, in the Punjab, in Calcutta. And then crucially, these exhibitions lead to permanent collections. So that, again, if we think about the Victoria and Albert Museum as now offering this incredible collection of the best of Indian arts, many of those things are coming through Kipling or men like Kipling. And again, they they help to define this is excellence in woodwork, or that is a typical design, or that is a particularly evocative design um, of its moment. So if Kipling was distinctive or unique, I would argue, among artificials for the breadth of his uh, sort of knowledge, for the depth of his relationships with artisans, and for his ability to get his ideas into the public, the idea, um, into the public eye, the one area in which he was definitely similar to art officials of his time is in his, his imperialism. So Lockwood Kipling believed deeply in the Indian, uh, in British control of India and in the British imperial project. Um, and in many ways, that's his argument would be that, and this is you know, classic 19th century imperialism, that Britain was there for India's own good, that it was, India was unable to rule itself, unqualified to rule itself, and so Britain would be there to help India forward. And there's ways in which I would argue that he saw his craft work or his work in arts as in many ways a sort of classic imperial project. I can help your craft tradition, you, India, in, to move forward. I can bring outside knowledge, the latest technologies, the latest innovations and instruction to help you forward. And again, he was very explicit in his writings that he needed to do it, men like him needed to do it, because Indian artisans could not do it themselves. So he writes, um, it is absurd to imagine that the natives can or should be left to himself to work out a sort of renaissance in the arts, unquote. His, the idea that he argued was that you needed guidance. You needed guidance by a sort of educated intellectual um, to sort of show people the appropriate lines. Guidance that would come from, quote, a government officer who is sympathetic alike with the popular expectations, the art, and the scholarship of the country. And you can see him writing that mean like, I'm here, right here, you know. So that sense in which that's his vision, which is you need a government officer like me who is sympathetic, 
knowledgeable and can work with it. And I will show the natives what they need to do. So again, I, for me, his imperialism is deeply written into his artwork. Um, it, you know, it takes nothing away from his deep appreciation for and all that he was able to offer the arts. But that sense of paternalism is there um, from the beginning. OK, so if that's a sense of, again, where he comes from, um, thinking about what of that carries forward is then the sort of crucial next part. Um, when Kipling is active in Lahore in the 1880s, he's the sort of center of the art world. Um, the American designer Lockwood DeForest shows up in um, Lahore trying to find out more about crafts or a project he's doing with Louis Tiffany. And he writes back to Tiffany that after meeting um, Kipling, he was, says, quote, by all odds, the best informed and cultivated man in Indian art art matters that I've seen or met. For him, he argues that, again, Lockwood de Forest argues that Kipling will, quote, be the head of all art matters um, in the northern part of India. So again, Kipling's the center of it. The problem is that it's a really small center. <laughs> um, and not actually that many people were interested in the project initially. And I think that's really crucial. Kipling is amazing at what he does and what he is interested in. but. His audience was somewhat un unsympathetic. And that audience is, on the one hand, British officials. So if this is the type of architecture that Kipling advocated, embraced, supported, done in traditional styles, in sort of old style urban settings, um, this is the stuff that the British were building. When they chose an architect for the new building, construction of the new capital in New Delhi, they looked at European architects who did not want fancy ornamentation. They just wanted select ornamental details on a sort of classically Europeanized um, structure. Um, he also, this is an image that Julius had up, um, Kipling railed against everyday public works architecture. This to him was the sort of height of ugliness. I actually think it's not that bad, but I'm not the architect. So in that sense, again, the, the British sort of officialdom, British policy was not actually that supportive of Kipling. Uh, they said, yes, you can have your art school, you can have your journal, but that's kind of the extent of it. We're not going to invest in deep scale uh, promotion of um, crafts and certainly not going to let it affect official public architecture. Um, public taste wasn't having much of it either. British um, consumption focused heavily on British imported goods. Um, so my current stuff is on sort of home consumption. And one of the major sort of, um, sort of marketers in Western India is the army and navy stores from London that has enormous catalogs published in Bombay selling everything imported. And this furniture on the right, even though it actually looks thoroughly ponderously British. It's even made in India, but there's nothing about that you're supposed to know, right? So it's meant to evoke Britain every way you can. Um, elite Indians weren't having much of it either, to be honest. Um, the sort of 1887 thoroughly Victorian interior on the left, or the 1930s sort of Indian Institute of Architect interior on the right. The sort of Indian elites were embracing global styles, cosmopolitan approaches. They were, did not want to be told to go back to traditional crafts or to confine themselves to what they saw as narrow in that sense. So if on the one hand there's little official support, um, there's sort of passive consumer disinterest saying they're going to want other things, the sort of more obvious challenge comes from the direct politics of Mohandas Gandhi. And on the one hand, there's an interesting sort of parallelism. Gandhi is obviously deeply invested in crafts. He embraces and promotes hand spinning and hand, hand weaving as the sort of moment and the basis from which to revive the nation. The sort of picturing of him always with a spinning wheel or that sense in which crafts are central to his vision of what the future was going to be. But other than that, Gandhi rejected everything that Kipling stood for. Um, and a sort of great illustration from a uh, 2004 book, no, sorry, 1994 book by um, Emma Tarlow. So Gandhi's vision is that you should get people out of the sort of Western clothes, formal attire for the court, and move everybody into simple, coarse, white, Kadi. And this was an ideal that was about rejecting fine luxury goods in terms of everyday objects. It was a project that was about creating visual uniformity. There would be no differences in between us if we were all wearing the same clothes. But it was also an investment in simple production. So 
the idea was that everybody should be able to spin and weave their own clothes, not that you need master craftsmen. So in many ways, Gandhi was a sort of profound rejection of everything that Kipling stood for by saying, we don't want exquisite, we don't want luxury, we don't want expensive, we want simple things done by everybody in everyday language and technology. And again, the sort of, if you go back to this picture, the fact that he's wearing that loincloth, um, it's a fashion statement, sure, but his argument is he won't put on more clothes until the rest of India has more clothes. So he's certainly not going to go advocating fine embroidery or you know elaborate wooden paneling when he says, I'm, I'm kind of cold, but I'm going to stay with a loincloth because nobody else in India has clothes. So again, in many ways, the sort of moment when crafts moves to the center of Indian nationalism in the 20s and the 30s, it's precisely the moment when Kipling falls off the table in ways that are, I think, kind of interesting. Um, all of which then says, what was Kipling's legacy, right? So it's a pretty dismal picture up to this point, I grant you. Um, there are sort of recoveries, and I promise I'll wrap up here. And the recoveries come after independence. So Indian independence comes in 1947, Gandhi is assassinated in 1948. The new move towards crafts in the early 1950s is the brainchild of a woman named Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, and she embraces the Kipling I approach aesthetic ideals in really interesting ways. So if Kipling is the sort of benevolent paternalism uh, figure for the 19th century, um, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay is literally known as Hastakali Ma, Mother Crafts, um, by craftsmen around the country. She's seen as the center of all art conversations, center to the vision of what craft should be for the new nation. And again, she takes up all kinds of things which Kipling had held dear and sort of embraces them. Um, like Kipling, she's interested in fine, exquisite, ex excellent work. She's always pictured in really beautiful textiles from that level. Um, she create, helps to create the national awards for master craftsmen, recognizing excellence in sort of technique, but also design. Uh, she, like Kipling, is a sort of regular and prolific writer about crafts. You have to know what you're doing and, and know what the traditions are in order to then improve on them, in order to revive them. So she's a prolific, again, writer, both in book form as well as elsewhere. Um, like Kipling, she's also an institution builder. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures I discovered. Look, does Andrew, and Dara Gandhi looks bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I always take that as like, okay, she is getting all the attention and I brought her here. Um, so it's supposed to be about cottage industries, but just look at that dynamic because it's not going anywhere good. <laughs> um, but so, so um, Kamala Devia starts to build institutions. She creates the Central Cottage in, um, Industries in Emporium in Delhi in order to provide a retail space where you can get the best of Indian crafts. Um, she helps to found the All India Handicrafts Board in 1952 to promote Indian crafts both as export as well as internally. She helps to form what's known as the National Crafts Museum or the All the I never get the full title, the National Handicrafts and Handlooms Museum in New Delhi to show off the best of regional traditions and to give access to the public to the vision of what crafts should be. Um, the, the sort of similarity Kipling shouldn't be taken too far. Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay was a fierce nationalist and a sort of active participant in radical nationalist politics. Um, first in sort of Gandhian constructive village work in the 1920s. She becomes the first Indian woman to stand for legislative election in 1926. She loses by 55 votes. Um, by the 1930s, she's turning to international socialism. So politically, She's not uh, on par with, you know, she's, she's opposed to the imperialism of Kipling. But that sense of the sort of benevolent paternalism or benevolent maternalism, um, I think is the point where they really are brought together. Uh, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay sees herself as bringing resources to and guidance to villagers who are stuck unaware of the latest trends. She does that personally by going around and visiting artisans in various places, giving them advice, giving them design ideas. She sets up design centers throughout India in order to, again, provide designs, provide examples, provide assistance to artisans. Again, that sort of Kipling um, idea. 
And again, the Craft Museum in, in Delhi functions very similarly as the Mayo, um, as the Lahore Museum had in Lahore, where artisans are asked to come and look at the examples. They can take things on loan if they want to bring it back and rework it into what they're doing. So that sense of you need enlightened leadership at the center. You need educated sort of elites to help provide the path forward from what's going on. Um, so again, the sort of the, the Kipling legacy, I argue, comes back in the 1950s. And then it has stayed, that sort of element of it has continued since. It has continued with the creation of new sort of craft institutions, craft focused institutions like the National Institute of Design, which set up in Ahmedabad in 1962, where students from the beginning have to be involved in craft documentation projects. They have to go out and know the craft in order to then return and become trained as industrial designers or product designers or whatever else. Uh, you can see it in the, oh, sorry, that. That logo came up very dark. Um, in the work of prominent NGOs, non-governmental organizations that start emerging in the 1980s and 1990s, Dustakar is one of the best of these. They're based in Delhi. Um, but their project, the way they describe it, is to say, we are professionals who came with a common vision of ensuring the future of India's rich crafts heritage by going out to artisans and helping them and giving them resources. We will stay as professionals in Delhi. We will go out. Um, and they now work with 350 different crafts groups they do amazing work all across India. Um, or then the sort of final example is through the sort of new generation of crafts, crafts entrepreneurs and retailers, um, sort of highest end at the top, Ritu Kumar. This is her pedestrian line. You should see her wedding clothes. Oh my <laughs> god, they're amazing. Um, or Anoki or Fabinho, all of which say they need to know more about crafts. They want to create long-term um, working relationships with crafts to then reinvent crafts for the modern era. I love all these organizations. NID, Dustakar, these sort of retailers particularly love their clothes. Um, they are great. I'm not saying there's anything bad about it. But there remains a fundamental divide in crafts development between um, educated elites who come from the cities and the artisans who are then often the passive recipients of design knowledge. So anthropologist Somia Venkatasan has sort of talked about the way in which this creates producers as skilled makers and members of the craft world as the knowledgeable directors. And so I think if we're thinking about what contemporary craft development shares with Kipling, uh, some of it is the appreciation, the knowledge, the investment, the desire to find new markets. But I think one of the reasons why we should be talking about Kipling is because that strain of the sort of gap, the tension between uh, appreciation for and then sort of controlling the, the direction of on high, where artisans still have a very difficult time becoming the entrepreneurs themselves, becoming the crafts leaders themselves. Uh, I think that tension remains, and I think it's one that's worth um, exploring. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.